I wanted to welcome um, everyone uh, for today's uh, presentation, yes. conference, event with SA Smythe that we're all very excited about. Um, this is the second event for the Arts Research Center, which I'm directing for the year. My name is Natalia Bisuela, and I teach in Spanish and Portuguese and Film and Media here at UC Berkeley. And for the year, the broad theme of the year is arts of critique. I'm thinking about art as a form of critique, but also of critique as an art form. Um, and for that, I convened uh, a group of amazing friends and colleagues from campus. Lee Rayford, who is here, Pamela Mustafa from English, Lee Rayford is in African American Studies, and Annika Lenson from Art History, who's not here today, and Tariq Al Haib from Anthropology from UC Davis, because we are very generously funded by a UCHRI, RI, UC campus faculty. So I, a, this is also an acknowledgement of their support. Um, today's a lecture, you know, when we invited Essay Smice, we thought maybe they were going to be here as a poet and performer, because they are also a poet and performer, um, besides uh, being a scholar. So, um, but they decided to present their scholarly self today. But who knows, we might get a little performance here. So, today's title is The Politics and Poetics of Imagination, the Black Mediterranean. Um, and Essay Smice is assistant, assistant professor of Black European Cultural Studies in the Department of African American Studies at UCLA. Though they're currently completing the UC President's postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Anthropology at UC Irvine. Smythe earned a PhD in History of Consciousness from UC Santa Cruz with a designated emphasis in feminist studies and literature. Smythe is currently founder and organizing member of the Queer Studies Caucus of the American Association of Italian Studies, publishing editor of Them, Trans Literary Journal, and associate editor for Scarf Magazine. Smythe is also a published and performing poet and an activist involved in black, queer, trans, and abolitionist writing collectives in London, Bologna, Berlin, and currently LA. Their academic book manuscript is Crisis and the Canon. Maybe it's changed. It's like four <laughs> times in the last five seconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there is a, there is an <laughs> academic um, book manuscript in my work <laughs> and a new painting title. <laughs> and, but their second book of poetry is titled Proclivity. And that one is forthcoming in 2019. So before we welcome Essay, I just also want to say that there's a graduate student working group um, that is meeting uh, regularly alongside the programming for the year's events, and that is um, very brilliantly directed and orchestrated by Diana Ruiz Flores from the Department of Film and Media, and a number of those of the members of that working group are here, and they are meeting with SA tomorrow at 1 p.m. in the conference room in this building, if anyone wants to join. I, you have to ask Diana if you have to be a graduate student to join. I, have, I don't know. No? Anyone. No. Anyone. Okay. Anyone. Okay. Well, thank you, for thank you so much. I'm gonna do like a, an accessibility checkpoint. If I can give up my seat here, so that two yeah. people, especially those blocking the exits for those who want to run in horror, <laughs> I'll promise to mostly hover and pace in this corner here. Thank you. Yeah. There's two seats up front. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so there are a lot of lies in that bio, as bios often are. <laughs> uh, and I write these things at 2 a.m. and like, this is genius! And then I, okay. Um, let's, okay. Um, thank you so much. So I'm going to read the gratitude and hopefully read it in a way that sounds very organic for the, for the recording. Um, <laughs> 
So I really, I really mean this, but I don't know if it sounds as earnest. Uh, so my talk today begins and ends with gratitude. Um, thank you so much to Lee Rayford for the generous uh, collective invitation. I'll get there. I wrote this book. Uh, as well as the generosity I received from you throughout our previous interactions. Um, thank you, uh, Natalia, for the introduction. Uh, Lauren Pearson, Lauren McPhee, um, and all others who facilitated my visit today, including uh, Pulomi Saha. Um, you said a few other names that I hadn't written down, but thank you so much to them. <laughs> I have uh, Diana Luis and Felix Rosen, um, and any other members of the steering committee that I left out um, for the series of events in Arts in the Global South. Um, thank you to all of you for being here. While I'm nervous, there's a seat right here. Um, the thanks are going to take just two minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for being here today. So like I said, it's going to be it's a little bit of a lie because I'm trying something new, like a hybrid form. So it wasn't untrue that it wasn't an academic talk, but there will be, there will be blood, there will be poetry. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll be talking um, further about the Black Mediterranean, also my own familial histories around uh, migration and colonialism. Um, so I first walked the halls of Barrows and Dunau specifically, what feels like five minutes ago, but on the plane I realized it was closer to a decade, which is also my birthday season, shout out Virgo, so I felt like, like <laughs> it is the Bay, right? I'm allowed to like, <laughs> get some astrology shout outs. That hasn't changed, <laughs> but it hasn't changed, it's on the end. Um, so, um, <laughs> so I've been here for a while, so it's really good. it's like a you know a homecoming return for me, even as I was like an intern for the year before I started my PhD. Um, also, our struggles are intertwined, and our dispossession comes in waves. It's intersectional. So, thank you so much to the Ohlone people who are stewards of this land on which we convene today, um, as well as all the other tribes and communities where, whose names I do not know to speak. Um, thank you to the land, and welcome to everyone. That was my introductions. Um, so here's how this is going to go, which is um, haphazardly to say the least. Um, I'm going to try to um, intertwine, so there will be a bit of like, theoretical overview, and then I'm also going to share space with that insect. I'm also going to share um, some poetic readings interspersed, and then I'm going to pivot, um, hopefully, with, uh, with some video. If things don't work, I see Lori has gone somewhere else, but maybe someone... Oh, we'll be back. Okay, I'm, I'm, I don't know how to use it. Uh, technology. Um, okay, so let's just dive in. I think I've done my nervous back in. Okay. Um, okay, so, thank you. Ultimately, I want us to have a conversation about uh, certain paradigms that lead to the normalization of violence undergirding what the ultranationalists and liberal humanists alike have referred to as a crisis of migration, but rather um, identify more as a crisis of white national and supranational identity plaguing contemporary Europe. Identify it that way because that's what it is. Um, this is more of an experimental talk, reading, sonic thing uh, that I can't really identify. Maybe it's better that way. Um, which is a result of my desire to affirm the writings and political struggles of black Italians, the so-called Italiani Senza Pirinanza, which is Italians without papers, a contradiction that we can talk about later, um, and other presumed demi or non-Italian subjects like refugees and asylum seekers who are negotiating their active dispossession in creative, collaborative, and political ways, stemming as it does from the need to scrutinize the racist and heteropatriarchal aspects of Italy's contemporary culture and political landscape that emerge in conversations about citizenship, migration, and solidarity. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems um, now that speak to what I've been, what I aim to talk about, what I started to introduce, um, as well as um, to the familial histories that I talked about earlier um, of coercive migration and colonial entanglement, um, with some sampling and a rearrangement that I've done uh, from a Black Mediterranean project um, called Inverno Muto, which is like meet winter in English. Um, which is a project by the collaborating duo Simone Bertuzzi and Simone um, Trabucchi, uh, which explores what, what remains of subcultures by moving through different media. So it's a, it's a sort of uh, <laughs> mashup of mashups. So they take a DJ sampling, but what they also do is um, consider anything sonic as a potential for a mashup. 
meaning um, overheard conversations, um, music, child sounds, um, talks from some academics who convened over the last two years. This is from a, a Manifesto Dodici, Manifesto 12, the Biennale, um, which this year is in Palermo. It's called a European Nomadic Biennale. So two years ago it was in Switzerland, this year is in Palermo. And so people like Paul Gilroy, Alessandro Di Maio, who I'll introduce um, in just a second, um, are some of the people that are like sampled and chopped. And I did my own rearrangement, um, of course, with their permission, and sort of blend in. So it's also a part of what I'm thinking about in terms of solidarity practices and collaboration. Um, and let's see what happens. I, again, have no idea what will happen. <laughs> So uh, a bit more about how they've conceptualized it. They say, uh, the sea once understood as a fluid entity that aided the formation of networks and exchange is now the scenario of heated geopolitical dispute. This ever problematizing milieu is the battlefield for increasingly complex identities. The sonic trails emerging from the Mediterranean, as Ian Chambers puts it, thus resist representation and propose an affective economy that is intrinsically diasporic. Dimmers on the lights, by any chance? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's quite off. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just read through a few poems, saying out the titles. We can talk more about what they mean after. Um, some of them are published already, some of them are the next book. This one's called Some Call It a Comeback. Is that good? Like I, <laughs> I just got back and I already feel the need to time travel again. Not the way that some white folks fetishize its possibilities, you know, the chance to touch everything, to say they were there, to spread their imperiousness across multiple dimensions. What even is whiteness if not the ultimate butterfly effect? Except all the butterflies are undead, actually they're emaciated moths and made of stone. Wherever they land, it's yours. Yours whose flesh they infect and turn inside out. You who they made believe the world was nothing but monarchs. I don't need that kind of time travel. I never wanted to be blue or a fifth element or have a ridged forehead using memorized, militarized hand gestures or even wear comically long scars while whizzing around alone for centuries in a telephone box. I've always wanted to do it the kindred way. Dizzying along my own time stream, wrenched sideways from oblivion, back to 2012 so I could say no and never know the treachery of Highway 17. Shout out, Sam, please. <laughs> back to 26 December 2010 so I could say something with regards to the genders that I left there. Something like let go but don't let go, or maybe will it hurt? I went back to September 2001 to May 1965 Back to 15 April 1989, August 1962, September 1984. I want December 1948 to July 1960, 1775 to 1493, 1882, something like that. And there's the fetish. I knew it would come. I want then, congealing right there in the 60s so I could tell my father to get off that plane. I'd say, turn back around, not yet, daddy. Tell him how things are better in Limon how it's hard but you'll miss yourself in the end, and how they'll do their best to break you, so let's just stay in the fields. We can build here, I said, as my hands are slowly becoming apparitions. I would have reappeared, embraced in the shadows of the broad Welsh beech trees in the middle of whispering to my mother how she doesn't need to stay. Remember that, I plead, while I'm there under her childhood bed, materializing at night once the candles go out, preparing her for a life of letting go by teaching her all of our undoing. I will have gone sweating, panting, racing through the throngs of dark young men in wide brim ties, wide brim hats and two long neckties queued up along the Kingston docks. I want to thrust myself into my ungrandfather's arms in June of 1948 and just beg him not to do it. Get the fuck off the boat, Mass Wilmot. Don't do this to us. The future is always already here. And we want or will have wanted or would be wanting that now I think I did say or will have said then, but I'm stuck. 
and I'm just not so sure anymore. I can see those flight attendants calling up security as my father kisses Abuela and Tia Maria and steps on the plane. I feel the Windrush man brushing me off my grandfather because I'm debris, but I show them then. I leave an imprint of tears and snot and blood, nail beds still bleeding like the Shroud of Turin on a Sunday best. Can see Madge shooing me out of my mum's house and I'm rapidly clawing at the floor as they pull me by my legs out from under the bed. It was always like that. Always bringing me back here like a moth to a flame or headfirst to the moon, unable to save ourself or the others and waiting to undo myself again. Anguish. They said I'd never know the word depravity until I leave you, so for the second time today, I leave you for words. To be fair, I mispronounce my whole self into these knots. One never dreams to inhabit the linear world until the end is near. Then you suddenly cannot help but imagine it. So this one is for being. Corrugated, listless limbs and flighty synapses still refuse to speak on the matter. All of our language crowns pull joyous, a returned anchor, its blinding thud through the heavy dark, as the bells outside sound helplessly. We slept before we made our way inside. We wept, began breaking a window by opening it. The midnight white flowers were watching. And then there was a chorus that repeated itself. While on our kneecaps, we could not listen since we were too busy wanting to learn and learn how to solve loneliness, how to become thieves filling rucksacks on rooftops. We watched the mystery of the same weddings of science and myth that the Greeks did. We built a boat out of berries and birch branches, tried to row it up a mountain instead of just changing the boat. We waited for the sea to rise and for the rock to liken itself to an island, we waited for the earth to library its boulders. In a languid city, I walked with my arms out, picking bricks off of the corners. I swallowed feelings without names that do not care if they make my stomach hurt. As I sit in this cell, as I dress like a ghost and dance to the sound of swords marking the trees with their sharpness. This is the pinpoint that marks where we are, kittening along overgrown motorways, head tilted to the map. The flanking boxy brick buildings, inscrutable signs announcing street junctions. The skyline, hoists, limp telephone vines and buildings, Sequoia Tor. Lights lick the evening air. No place else smells like here. Wind sweeping lake scent across town, the sweet sayer of grilled meat, hints of desert around the edge. You're thinking of earth or assembly line or what anchors person to place. You consider fidelity and wonder if you're even capable. But this woman shows her midnight shoulder in the curl of each bridge, her lack of geometry stopping you cold. It's so part of it. <laughs> Um, so I'm gonna, like I said, I'm just gonna keep keep reading through these. Um, and try also to slow down so that they're time to other things. Um, but I hope if you have questions afterwards, that it will come together in some way, so you can hold on to any of the imagery or anything. Um, this next one, for example, um, so again, like I said, some of them are personal family history, also my time in the Mediterranean. I read myself as a part of that. Um, and not like, an anthropological outsider. Um, but as I'll talk about um, the film clips that we'll see uh, shortly, some documentaries in that space, um, there are some people that I've spoken to that were themselves migrants, refugees or asylum seekers, and I spoke to them. So parts of the, the, the poetry collection also includes um, a, a series of chronologies of exchanges um, based from those interactions. Um, and this is one. The Mediterranean Sea, crossing 48, Barney. 
I found her smitten by possibility, digging for a trove of enough sunlight to fill a shot glass. Exploration into the timber and woman stance of her new work, finally to speak clear and proud as a bell. Uncracked, unweathered, you know, to speak purely to people. She saw the meaning of her being and how she would wreck an old life as she hatched. But who knew just how necessary those words would be when she made her terrified way into the wildness of her freedom dreams. Just one more, but it's two. <laughs> the truth is, if a screaming cat is an agonized child, then the shadow boring holes in your back from its lawn could be a woman, tugging and pulling her hair so hard that clumps are ripping loose. He's coming for you. By each noise in the room against yours, a filament crackling, furniture scraped on the floor, the sigh of a vent at odd hours, or the kettle on heat is a throat half held half closed. You know, the animals are his too. The bear in the zoo, the stray crossing, crossing your half, the birds droning overhead, the actual drones, the moths immolated in your lamps, the white woman avoiding eye contact as she fumbles for her phone, the numbers one and two worn down from use. It doesn't matter if he's coming for you. He already has. Um, I see here, uh, an introduction I should have made to this. In Europe, it's 112 for your 999, the number you do. <laughs> I don't call it, neither should you, so why do I need to know this? <laughs> but 911. <laughs> The real last one, uh, for now. I wrote over the title, so let's see what the title is. You can tell me that. I'm trying to create a sentence that doesn't use metaphors. Someone, please, just give me a language that's exact. I don't want to believe that life is somehow both a fire and a river, that love is a journey and a physical force and a Shakespearean illness. In that way, interdisciplinarity runs the risk of novel partition. Erare, some Latin. Romance's root is to wander and to be wrong, two things I've never been capable of doing casually. That root is from a rose that is a rose that is a rose that is a rose that is annoying to perceive. Yet its dried yellow petals still flake away in my hands when I've scooped them up from the vase. You have no name here, but the faded copy of your wedding certificate tucked neatly in the corner of your burnt out passport, coupled with this photo of your mouth on my mobile phone, are you because they carry your face. They wouldn't be you if it was of your mouth or of your arm, and it isn't you now. I want to say freedom is more than the horizon. We are the horizon, but I'm floundering in this, in this, and also ever in this because metaphors are truly the deep end. They are pillow queens, they are trap doors, they are borders, and they are crowded, crowded train cars. for me. Okay, this is my version of a smooth segue. It's got to happen in the body. So um, just to sort of make a little return or re-entry, um, my primary scholarship is on uh, the Italian and Italophone writings by contemporary authors of African descent um, and the struggle to resist genocidal regimes of gender and race. Um, this work, as been hinted to earlier, is part of the growing discourse around the Black Mediterranean, a site which is a concept that I first read described by Alessandro Di Maio, 
um, in which she argues that the term focuses on the proximity that exists and has always existed between Italy and Africa, separated but also united by the Mediterranean, and documented in legends, myths, histories, even culinary traditions, in visual arts and religion. In my view, the term and its attendant regionalism also foments a cultural syncretism, intimacy and expansiveness, while leaving room for that specificity for, the, for those who seek that within a transnational frame, between Italy and Africa specifically, um, as the Mayo does. I'm also invested in the black radical tradition via Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism. We continue the earlier legacy of diaspora studies, but also developed a conception of the black Mediterranean as, quote, a precondition to the black Atlantic and the making of Europe itself. Like, it just was very shady in the comments, I was just um, hmm. So, there's a lot of discourse to be had. If there are people specifically interested in like the genealogy of the Black Mediterranean, especially when my book project will go and sort of diverge, um, Alessandra, so the Mayo takes it specifically from, um, from Gilroy, um, and so I, and I do not, <laughs> to, to keep it, to keep it succinct. Um, I specifically like follow more closely with Cedric Robinson and think about uh, a more um, anti-colonial um, abolitionist frame than um, the occasional bummer town that is the very important work of Paul Gilroy. <laughs> <laughs> very important work. I'm, ser I'm serious. It is really important. Uh, I, I appreciate him, but I think let's just move forward because um, <laughs> there's no way I can. Um, okay, so. Basically, the, the distinction between what Gilroy does and, 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 or the people who take up sort of black Atlantic into black Mediterranean, which I think is the epistemological problem that I have, sort of applying black to an oceanscape. Um, mm -hmm. Like, no shade, but you know, there's black Pacific now we're hearing these different iterations, and I think if we actually focus on the black part, maybe we will sort of get ourselves out of some of that trouble that provides. Um, so between those two sort of um, iterations, um, is something like what Antaldua would refer to as a sustained contradiction, right? So the space for fraught creativity and tension that would lead away to new consciousness. Um, so when we account for the intersecting oppressive forces of a colonial world order that is historically codified who can be said to belong or to be afforded the right to life, we know that we lose um, we know that those we identify as marginal subjects, migrants, queers, trans people, disabled people, the litany, um, which I'll get to later, that kind of litany, um, and the overlapping constituencies, constituencies therein, um, are at best peripheral, if not well beyond the periphery of that kind of belonging. Um, Italian sociologist Alessandro Bellago, who writes a lot about migration in Italy, um, uh, in his book Non non-persons, non-persona, um, writes that equating the migrants with the enemy might seem misleading insofar as it is associated with a political definition of foreigners. It goes without saying that no war has ever been declared against migrants. And they don't display, obviously, their relative status as enemies. But migrants are in fact treated as enemies because they have the temerity to invade our national space. So the black Mediterranean and the black Italian um, and migrant culture producers that I study and collaborate with um, are sites and people that I view as considerable points of queer concern, which I don't get super into besides my literal embodiment up here, but if we have uh, questions about that, because there are sometimes camps um, within a US or Anglophone context between what's queer studies, black queer studies, or black studies. Um, uh, and in Europe, it is a little bit, it's even more entrenched. Um, to say the least, and Paula and colleagues have written about this. Um, but the implication of how bodies get stratified, produced, and managed, um, in a Sidian sense, in relation to citizenship, is clearly designated in cultural, ethno-racial, sexualized, and gender terms. And Audre Lorde, of course, has told us that poetry is not a luxury. It is the way that we give name to the nameless. So the configurations across the racial spectrum undergirding the legal status of migrant, refugee, citizen expands the artistic and thus political capacity for naming and articulating blackness and queerness outside of binary norms. Um, and of course, these are cer uh, certain articulations of which queer and trans theory also take as their aim. 
The collective specter of the marginalized, bodies marked by blackness, queerness, disability, and so on, rise up out of a perceived and oppressive ubiquity within the Mediterranean and globally. It continues to resurface out of epistemological and ontological oppression, ever vigilant in its struggle for survival and autonomy, and either resisting normative paradigms or being subsumed within it. Alternate economies of being together in true solidarity um, as accomplices are what I've witnessed being affected in the capacious category of the black Mediterranean. Right, so again, it's, that's why it's not um, so useful for me that it's this plangent site of loss and death. It is definitely that, but the capacity for resistance um, and, and um, other forms of being are, are really powerful and I think need to be attended to a bit more. This, along with the Black Italian literary and artistic production, um, takes up the matter of black life and ancestry, to which we might always return, and always already returning, to teach us about the condition of belonging while traversing seas, um, again with Antaldua, in psychosocial, geographical, embodied, historical, and otherwise, that should be claimed for the emergence of a more just and radical world. One site um, that I've been engaging is uh, the Archive of Migrant Memories, I'll be talking about a little bit. Um, an ephemeral archive, art space, digital um, site, um, and edu an educational space focused on documenting memories written through um, oral, oral and written testimony. Um, it's a space facilitated by white Italians, black Italians, um, some Roma, an array of non-citizens with uh, the equity of labor and protective proximity from the state in the case of those who are most vulnerable to it. Right, so it's again, it's not Italy and Africa because Italy and Africa also means that there is some sort of equality there, that there's equal exposure to the state and that means murder for some. Um, um, AMM, which I'll just call it now, um, the projects include Benvenuti in Italia, Welcome to Italy, um, and the Lampedusa Project. But Welcome to Italy is a five-part documentary series um, filmed and directed by a group of uh, migrants and political refugees from Somalia, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Senegal. The first documentary was To Whom It May Concern, um, developed by Somali political refugee and journalist um, Zakaria Muhammad Ali, uh, who landed and was detained in Lampedusa in 2007. Um, so in the documentary, he returns four years later to search for the documents of um, that he uh, lost or were disposed of, and those of his fellow asylum seekers. He also goes to retrace his experiences there um, and recount the journey that he and thousands of others have faced every year to the chagrin of increasingly hostile and murderous European political regimes. Um, so, gosh, do I just... Uh, so I'm just going to play this for a bit. Three minutes and 58 seconds. Um, Audio? Oh, is there no? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, great. Oh, boy. Okay. Where do I see your audio? Yep. But I played it, it was playing before. There was some music stuff playing before. Can you hear that in the. No. Yes. 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 Okay.
con il mare ho scoperto che che c'è questo isola che si chiama la luce quando abbiamo preso la decisione che ho fatto la parte perché abbiamo visto qualche luce alcune persone dicevano è lì è la luce quella direzione no non è la luce in un'altra parte c'è stata una discussione ma io non conoscevo neanche dove sto andando e... ma sapevo che stavo nella fuga era la seconda volta che era il 10 agosto 2008 della giornata della partenza da una volta che siamo arrivati proprio al porto mi ero ricordato che quella isola era questa ricordare e di non dimenticarsi proprio qui in questo posto intendo che io sono arrivato al 13 agosto 2008 era di notte verso le due quella ora siamo arrivati direttamente al porto dove abbiamo accappato sul muro c'erano alcuni ragazzi con i motorini che sono stati loro a chiamare i carabinieri e alla fine è arrivato un puma mi ricordo era scritto la medusa è da lì che abbiamo scoperto che siamo arrivati alla medusa ero insieme a sei amici mi ricordo benissimo il loro nome e ancora siamo rimasti in amicizia che non ci sapremo mai si chiamano Masla come Abdel Fattah Alas Omar Abikar tutti questi amici erano amici del viaggio del deserto anche il mare di cosa serve la memoria? la memoria è l'unico ponte che si collega con qualsiasi So it's only 16 and a half minutes, but it's very dense. Um, uh, in my larger projects, I'm not talking about it too much here, but I, I think about um, the politics of naming, um, both in terms of queer trans poetics and aesthetics, but choosing to name oneself, remembering the names of others, um, as, as we see here. Um, but also, um, I'm going to read the sentence and then say my, <laughs> say my thing, but uh, the histories of votes in this brief documentary are bounded and dynamic. Right? So Somali occupation and colonialism by Britain, Italy, and other imperial powers um, are directly responsible for its recent categorization as a failed state. Thus, Zafaria's uh, is a call for remembrance and liberation from that space and more than just a call to perform a constitutive outside, like the permanent figure of the other migrant refugee. Um, and so back to this um, thing about the book, the politics of naming in, Italy, in Italy and um, in some, I mean, some other Romance languages, there is a name day, like onomastico, you know this? So in Italy, that's your name day, right? If your name is Samuel, mine it, ish is, that's the day that you celebrate. Do you, are you familiar? Um, there's also something that I I'm trying to see, it feels like a clunky phrase, but I think about something like a colonial onomastics, right? Naming something that was already named. So like Mumbai, Bombay, um, Brawe, to, which is a city in Somalia, to Brava. I mean, you know, Brawe is perfectly easy to say and already exists. Um, so this, this, this desire to sort of uh, reiterate, name over and reclaim and, and the, the colonial logics therein. Um, but, While he doesn't talk about it, um, it's really in the present in terms of a personal journey from him and his comrades, his friends, um, and people he met um, at the start of the journey. Um, these listings, he also, there also uh, is an eternal logic of naming, uh, patriarchal naming in Somali culture that also um, withholds in itself a, 
uh, uh, not just a patriarchal but also a colonial logic. Um, and I'm going to show apparently another little clip. Can you hear the back? Where are the back? The materials remain at the center, the materials are sparkling. Where can we find them? Because there are a lot of artists, a lot of photos, certificates. Some things are the memories that we have lost and we are in the search of these materials. The materials are at the center? Yes, that we have left at the center when we are sparkling. Uh, so we must note here right, the farce of the recurrent practice of surveillance and enumeration, that is of counting people as things that are actually being accountable, accountable to them or, or their belongings, that seems to conform to the logics of accumulation that of course structure racial capitalism, um, in which the quantified abstraction of black and or migrant deaths by organizations um, and the so detention centers, but also larger organizations such as the International Organization um, for Migration, IOM, or various social and or mass media, uh, reveals the calculated value of black life through the state's own language, or grammars, to use Horton Spillers, of deficit, death, and debt. Um, I've cited this elsewhere, but Catherine McKittrick calls this the mathematics of unliving in mathematics black life. More concretely, let us consider where we account for the loss of uh, people like Patessa Bali, Emankili uh, Namdi, um, Jose Torno, and the dozens of others who are murdered or allowed to die by the necropolitical machinations of callous and dehumanizing statecraft once the black or migrant subject reaches European soil. Now, there have been a lot of stories about um, migrants, either like the, the two I named um, in particular, Musia also is another from Eritrea, um, who uh, was allowed to die. Um, uh, I feel weird saying took his own life because I don't actually think those are the logics at play. Um, entirely, uh, when they arrive and they make it through the process similar to uh, Zakaria, um, but then are ultimately rejected, as what happens um, in Italy with increasing rates, I and mean, even before March, with the recent elections, what would happen in Italy um, as the, I'm just assuming, geography, you know, uh, that Italy being a southern point in Europe was one of the first places that people arrived. Right, I can pull up a little map um, after this. But what winds up happening is that even if that's not their destination, they go through Italy. Um, Italy ostensibly um, ought to have at the time and still now, um, but it's much less enforced with this recent um, definitely fascist regime, was meant to fingerprint them and then have them go through the process. Italy often did not do this fingerprinting because it will wind up happening is um, if they got um, checked at another point, like if they got all the way to Sweden, for example, they would then be sent back to their last port of entry, which would be Italy. Italy didn't want to be accountable to these people. So they would be then rejected for political asylum, but then they also um, don't have a recourse, much like uh, in this Babylon we're living in now, right? You don't get to just start from go again. It's sort of it, and you're in this um, no person's land. Um, so people often feel like they don't have any recourse, and indeed they do not, either through um, uh, statecraft, through this kind of legislation, but also um, through the increasing hostility in the communities where they're living. So, you know, it's garbage all around, um, <laughs> is my intellectual. It's filmed, isn't it? Like, you guys keep <laughs> forgetting um, this whole thing. Okay. Surveillance and enumeration, I was saying. Um, So not only do they care, or not only do they definitely not care about counting, accounting for these people, but like we saw in the previous clip and in this one here, um, specifically Zakaria Ali and his friends are looking for um, documentation. Um, he later, I actually maybe um, skip this clip, but he either just finished talking about um, in that list of, of, of documents, uh, or goes on to say that 
you know, he's a, he is a journalist. He's trained as a journalist in Somalia. He had these diplomas. He had these other degrees. And he had photos of his family on his, like, when he graduated. So these things that are actually have material value that nobody can account for and nobody can trace. And that also matters in terms of rendering these people, uh, or like affording them their humanity, or even being able to trace um, uh, their own histories, right, instead of piecing together memories. Um, and there actually is no legal uh, reason for them to be taking this sort of um, documentation. He says later around this time of the clip, was this t-shirt was given to him by his sister when he landed in Lampedusa, that they took his clothes, they took the clothes of all the people because they wanted to control for lice and other diseases. That you could maybe see getting away with if you didn't want to sterilize those things, but in terms of a wedding certificate or a photo of your son who you don't know how to identify or where to find, is actually um, uh, sort of a greater moral concern that is more an exertion of power than actually what is required by law, even though that law is already um, white supremacist and garbage. So it's like a, either way, uh, this is uh, at least of moral concern, but then we have to beg the question, whose morals and whose morality within this white supremacist frame? So just to um, move, move forward a little bit, uh, gosh. Uh, during the height of Italian Empire and in the midst of the partition of Africa, which was roughly 1880 to 1914, or if you take me for a drink, up to 2018, I would argue, um, <laughs> glassmakers from Murano and Venice made many of the beads and the glassware proffered by colonial European states to the inhabitants of the territories across the continent um, of Africa that European powers were intent on conquering. This example of trans-imperial entanglement resonates a great deal with my current concerns around global citizenship, racialization, and uh, cultural exchange in the post-colonial era. Um, because also, um, besides the contemporary uh, nature of Italy's um, um, racism and, and white, white supremacist tendencies or acts, um, they often, you still, in the year of someone's law, 2018, get away with them saying that they didn't colonize anywhere which is uh, true because Italy didn't exist yet. But again, Venice and these other cities definitely were the bankers of these spaces, right? Merchant of Venice, that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. And that's, those are the same groups that have funding to sort of make Italy move today. So Italy is certainly complicit. Um, it's a technicality that um, we certainly shouldn't buy, but they do get away with it uh, on a regular basis. Um, in breaking down what racial regimes are and do, Cedric Robinson, um, who um, I know this term from, let us know that it isn't just that race is a construct, but that it lies within a panoply of constructs that actively undermine its revelation. It's just like the very idea of Europe, right? You have a lot of European nation states that don't like to say that they're um, white or a Christian, France being a very palpable example. Um, even just this morning in the news, where they don't like to say race, they're trying to get it abolished from the Constitution, and yet, look at all of these racisms. Um, <laughs> but films like Ali's and other migrants, political refugees, and citizens within the um, ar uh, archive of migrant memories show us that the connection between present and the past, including the history of colonialism, emigration, and international migration, underlining that Italians have occupied positions of hegemony, um, and subalternity in different historical times and geographical locations. Right? Because Italians also, um, ethnic white Italians, white with inverted commas, so they got white when they moved um, out of Italy, um, for the most part, uh, were racialized and ethnicized in a particular way when they came to places such as New York, uh, New York or yes, but uh, the US, Australia, um, and, and the UK, to a lesser extent, Canada. And so often that's also what we see, right? If Europe um, within its racial regime is refusing to acknowledge its whiteness, or again, prior to this recent Italian election when white just seems to be popping up a lot more um, as a term, Italians used, to, Italians used to go around saying they were a Mediterranean race, but now it's a lot easier to just say we're, we're white people. Um, that's a weird clip, don't dissect like that one. Um, but what we see in this sort of dynamic is that they used to be able to say, and uh, uh, we're going to take this part out of the out of the video. But I, in my experience, going to university and spending time in Italy, have experienced Italians, um, also like ethnic white Italians, who have said, 
to me um, that they're the blacks of Europe when I, a black of Europe, am standing two inches from their faces. Um, but that's precisely because of this sort of history of um, racial discrimination, because of the, su I mean, the Southern question from Gramsci, for those of you who know this, and also the racialization that they actually experienced out of Italy, um, or those who are from the south of it in relation to the north, which is more industrialized. Anyway, I'm going to um, wrap up through a lot more ranting than I really meant to do um, from this. Um, Okay, well, an intersectional approach, um, and I'm actually under, I'm negotiating, so if someone will want to talk about this with me, I'm all ears um, to that term and, and how it applies or um, uh, is made to move. But for now, an intersectional approach to black studies, um, of which I'm a part, and queer studies, of which I'm a part, and I read these things, of course, together, means acknowledging and mobilizing a shared concern, again, over that farcical and recurrent practice of enumeration, of uh, uh, counting and non-accountability, um, racial capitalism, etc. Ultimately, um, an underlying question embedded in these enumerated practices and codifying citizenship um, wherein, again, people can be born in Italy and not a citizen, so citizenship is in effect racialized because people who have an ethnic claim, there are people, those same people who I said uh, migrated, that was around uh, the formation of Italy in the late 19th century, their great-great-grandchildren, um, white, uh, white Americans at this point, um, could apply for citizenship when people born and raised in Italy and their children um, would have to apply as opposed to being granted it. So that's the question of usoli versus usanguinis. The US, I was gonna say the US has usoli, but as we see in the media, that effectively is not actually the case, um, nor was it necessarily ever, in that citizenship can be readily stripped of certain racialized gender bodies. Ultimately, the struggle for citizenship of so-called second generation, that would be the children who were born in Italy, um, whose parents migrated, second generation or other Italians, specifically of color, also Roma people and Sinti travelers, people who get considered nomadic, even though actually those cultures tend not to move as much as they're categorized and their citizenship is rendered second class as a result. Um, the question remains, what are the seductions for state-oriented activism for which traumatized citizenship is more than a merely identitarian pitfall, but rather a key beyond emergency and a set for radical emergence? That's some, some Benny Me with the Berkeley crowd. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen time and time and time again the state's disavowal of refugees and asylum seekers, even Italians without papers, so-called, they're without papers, they're Italians, which is it, um, from the willful assimilation and traumatized recognition. Something that I'm always asking, um, like at night with my fist up, is do we want the state to love us or do we want to be free? That's a question for every day. Is what we are fighting for conditional citizenship, or are we making demands and laying the grounds for our own emancipation? And of course, the emancipation of others, which is uh, the same. Um. Okay, I think that's the last thing. When I see the one sensation, I always remember it.
consumerist individualism and cis nationalist frameworks. The matter of black life, survival, and thrival in Italy is already one of an attention to those rendered the most precarious and marginalized, which fosters full use of coalitional imaginative practices, right? Black people, uh, people of African descent, people crossing the Mediterranean Sea, even if they don't know each other, they're still willing to um, recognize and acknowledge each other and realize that they've known each other and they're in it together, right? There's a sense of solidarity uh, uh, and a desire to um, not make it just for the sake of the journey, right? There's no reason for Zafaria to uh, return to a site of trauma, to find documents to a person who's not able to make that journey, if not to just hold that memory and to believe that that is what needs to be done. There's a moral imperative there um, that I think we all do well to, to consider. These coalitional practices include an abolitionist vision that sees a world without border regimes and gives way to full bodily autonomy and freedom of expression. I always like to suggest uh, that my project is a novel, a work towards emancipation and affirmation. Uh, so I'd like to close with a note on how that fits in within frameworks uh, of meaningful solidarity. Again, not just Italy and Africa, which is a common rhetoric you hear in Italy for those who are aware or choose to acknowledge the history of Italian colonialism, you hear, we're just across the sea. Um, also, uh, a notable person who said that was Mussolini, who called parts of Northern Africa the fourth shore, right? It rounded out the peninsula of Italy. So proximity is not solidarity. We can all look at a map, but that doesn't actually give us um, the movement that we need. We must remember that affirmation 
meaningful affirmation does not claim the agency of another. It merely confirms and corroborates one tru one's truth, which takes as much compassion as it does imagination. When I'm in Italy, you know, Catholics central, um, I like to talk about Jesus. <laughs> Just leaving it. Um, but no, in liturgy, it's a very Catholic conceit. In liturgy, um, affirmation is a real thing, where you get confirmed, you get affirmed, it's a whole, it's a whole deal, you wear the gown. Liturgy is a moment um, in which what one believes is held in direct tension with the beliefs of those who it is believed lacks that truth. There are too many negatives in that, right? But you're not affirming a negative. You're saying, I believe, I'm aware that there are non-believers. I'm doubling down on my belief, God, Son, Holy Ghost, the whole shebang, etc. The archive of migrant memories, in Vermomuto, and many, many other, there are so many, proliferating projects who take um, the same citizen migrant refugee, who think of different statuses, different ethnicities, and are aiming towards um, a, the sh a shared and equitable aim, an abolitionist one, draw upon several grids of intelligibility to share for us new possibilities and pathways to more meaningful belonging. Actively denouncing any claims to a monological or monoracial Italian identity in the process. So to affirm is more than just a proclamation. It's more than just a performative. Berkeley shout out number two. It's an ethical project in which Italy remains a rich archive from which to enact from its place of deep thought within the black Mediterranean. But the radical and opaque practice of collaborative projects comprising multiple languages, legal statuses, and other identities occurring in and across the Mediterranean. Occurring in and across the Mediterranean attempt to ensure that the thousands of people who undertake the treacherous journey are not reduced to ontological receptacles of negative affect and political talking points to procure more funding for more securitized borders and all who are shaped by colonialism, imperialism, and racial capitalism are forced to reckon with those legacies. I'm going to close out with this. I can say. The other day I saw a branch that looks like you, but only from certain angles. I had a thought and you were there, saying something like, friends are not the ones you know, but the ones you recognize while I drew with my fingers a caricature of the sea. There is a jaw in my mouth where everything fits. I mean to say that it accumulates and builds small houses. The other day I thought about the language we use to describe space and how every border ushers in the sadism of its maintenance, while the architecture of the worlds you've built are miles away. But scratch all of that. Tonight we start with the ending. We walk the entire way backwards. With each callous novelty, we bury something else, dig and reverse. Uncover the trace evidence underneath feet raw and undone. This is said to be a journey of loss, is it not? Mileage measured by things taken from world dis words disappearing from pages read, the ink flows streaming back into pens and ideas. The numbers on mobile phones unsolve themselves until no one hears anyone else. Houses return to the soil they rose from, and there are nothing but live, naked bodies left standing in the rain, the warm sun, the new night, the whole sky so big that it's easy to pick up the pieces of this destruction and make something entirely new.
maybe. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the two videos by um, Riva Mabuto yeah. that you showed, because at least in the way you presented them, there was a kind of trans-like element to mm -hmm. the viewing of them. And so I wasn't sure if that was your choice in the presentation, or if, if that the aesthetic of those videos. Yeah. And what does that mean if they are embedded in this, you know, a history about movement, yeah. forced migration, displacement, etc. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I it definitely was a choice. Um, <laughs> the Paul Gilroy one, funnily enough, mm -hmm. uh, is really pumped. They sent me a bunch of so so the project, like I said, was from the Biennale. But what um, uh, for the digital space, what they wound up doing is um, uh, putting it up for a, a week, a fortnight, ten days. Mm -hmm. So the, the the track, like the the mix called Paul Gilroy, um, would be up for ten days. You can go on this website right now. DJ Rhino is playing. Ghanaian DJs was not um, affiliated, like not in Verno Muto, but was an external uh, force, and that'll be there until the 23rd, but there's no way to save it. Um, so it's uh, very transient and ephemeral, much like the second aspect. So ephemerality is a significant part of um, the Black Mediterranean um, project, Black Med project in this case, but also within the archive of migrant memories. Um, which I didn't talk about that at all today, except by name, the Lampedusa project, um, briefly uh, would entail, uh, for example, uh, a show by the sea, by the coast of Lampedusa, and people would um, be reciting things or reading out things or saying people's names from a piece of paper like Zakaria had, and uh, they would watch the tide ebb and flow, basically, and the pieces that were on the ground um, that they would witness, they'd watch it wash away. So it's part of the archive, but there's nothing that you actually necessarily have. Um, some things you do have, and they give it as an offering, but often uh, things wash up all the time. Uh, Lampedusa, which is a poor fisher's town, people would be fishing up um, very often the, the uh, salvage, the vests, the orange vests. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. Um, Nike shoe, uh, a piece, a, a worship mobile phone, like different ephemera from the sea, and that's all they would have from the people that were uh, lost to the sea, right? And so, as a way to sort of memorialize that, but you don't know who that is, this project sort of came to came to fruition. Um, and so, it's both, but it's both somber and it's also joyful, right? There are um, um, real like storytellers, musicians that come to these sorts of events. It's not meant to be um, a sort of Western funeral. Mm -hmm. um, that won't happen anyway, as far as Europe is concerned, I think. <laughs> so, so no, it's definitely, um, this is some aspect of it. Also, um, when people, as we trickle out, I can even play towards the end. There's some real dope Arab hip hop, even on this one long mix. Um, but what I was doing in terms of what I was reading um, is intentionally either slow down um, the DPM, slow down the tracks, um, or uh, chose uh, chose uh, um, more motile, motile uh, aspects that I guess do sort of evoke that trance, mm -hmm. specifically because um, if what I was talking about, when I was thinking about it, it felt, first of all, it'd be jarring for me to also read with that, which might have been a good thing. I'm open to feedback on this, but I also felt like uh, um, it's not always, the treachery is not always in the amping up of sound or movement, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, actually, I mean, we're in California, I don't know how to, so, you know, Californian water sport, I can't do those, but, you know, I know that something like when it's a slow, you can be dragged out slowly out to mm -hmm. sea, that's also a part of it. So for me, I was also reflecting mm -hmm. on these sorts of things. It doesn't need to just look like thrashing, right? Someone who's drowning, may not look like they're drowning, they actually are looking very still, sometimes their mouth is open and they're silent because they're trying to breathe. It's not always the thrashing and the thing that we perceive in a often Western ontological framework as violent. Mm -hmm. right, we don't actually know what violence is. So. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for that. That was so interesting. I have a question that maybe follows from this, which is about materiality. Mm -hmm. and, um, the second clip that you show 
from the Chicken Living Concern, uh, Zakaria says, these are the material. These are the memories we're looking for. These are the materials. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm struck that you just described these deeply material objects that survive the sea as ephemera. Mm -hmm. see, which seems to me is a, an interesting coding mm -hmm. of what remains as yeah. that which uh, is on its way to not remain. So I'm just wondering how the question of like gross materiality um, affects the, the, the Black Mediterranean project, questions of memory. Yeah. What is actually like physically present and yeah. what decays, what remains? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I can I I can I'll speak in a very plain way um, that there is a lot of matter. There's a, a, an exorbitant amount. It's really, and it also I mean it's it's perfect. I wish I had. Um, I know some people who are environmentalists um, or environmental Italianists, for example, um, but unfortunately they don't necessarily often see race as important. Um, and in a moment like this, or in thinking about the Mediterranean, um, the same question that you're asking, um, I wish that they had a better analysis around race, and so I'm actually still looking for, for texts and, and resources around that, because uh, it intersects with almost everything else, right? Class, nation, the north-south divide in Italy, because for a lot of Italy, the mafia runs the refuse um, control, right? Um, like in Naples or Sicily, they're the one who clean or, or don't, and like hold the local um, governments hostage effectively. Uh, in places like Lampedusa, which is incredibly poor, um, and has a significant number of African um, migrants, refugees, um, and asylum seekers in detention center, but even outside of that, people who um, are navigating that city. But in general, like I mentioned earlier, many fishermen and people who are constantly as part of their work navigating the sea more than literally the Italian government is because, and this is why, I don't like maps, they're two-dimensional and definitely racist, but sometimes I wish I could like Al Roker a map um, because, or whatever contemporary mother guy. But, um, <laughs> Because you can see, oh, there it is, put Lampedusa right there. I'm going to come back. I just conjured it. Um, in Lampedusa, that, that, that blip there, it's a very small island, is actually closer to like Tunisia than it is to mainland Italy. And you can hear like the calls to prayer in the morning readily. On a clear night, you can see it, like Palin, Alaska, Russia, like that. Uh, but you can really just, you can see it there. So what that means effectively is that the social economy is hyper um, entrenched. They're picking up the matter, and they're also going further out than, um, I'm glad you're back, um, than, than the, the line that the Italian government keeps um, receding. So um, I didn't. I, I skipped this little paragraph, and I, I felt myself gaining up on a rant on colonialism again. But uh, when Mussolini was talking about the fourth shore, he was able to do that because he literally that's where that's where Italy ended, right? This is Italy. It's a process called irredentism, where you can go to a place, say that there's Italians there, and now it's yours. Um, Putin has, did a similar, th you know, like you can say, look at these ethnic Russians. It's Russia. We should have it. Um, uh, it's like a colonialism by a, by a fancier name. Um, and so whereas that used to be the case in the previous like iteration of a fascist regime, now you have um, the, the current Conte government for now um, that's saying, oh no, no, Italy is like right here. Like this is the land and Italy is like here. So we don't need to go out there um, and rescue people because they're not in Italian waters, they're in international waters, not our problem. So actually who's effectively going further are fishermen partly because of the refuse problem. Not, the matter is not the problem, but the pollution and the refuse and other forms of um, uh, environmental waste and disasters. They're also going further out to fish. They're more um, confronting the materiality of um, the, the, this quote unquote migration, crisis of migration. Does that answer your question? So the materiality, there's a, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of the matter, um, and so uh, by ephemera, I think maybe I even miss. I didn't mean that it was sort of like necessarily ephemeral purely, but rather uh, they were kind of sitting with like the fleeting nature of it, like the ephemeral nature of things. So some of those belongings, um, like the memory, is definitely what remains, but that thing 
comes onto shore and then will go, something else will take its place. It's, take its place. It's not the same as I want that specific photo. I want this specific T-shirt. That he talks about later. No, I'm not. Oh, okay. I don't know if I'm answering. That's great. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm curious in a lot of your poetry, you were looking at you very Yes. I was wondering how to speak a little bit about who would be used on their multiple Yeah. I'm so stoked about that question. Stoked. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I can quickly talk, just very quickly talk about myself again, thanks. Um, <laughs> second chapter of my book project, I talk about uh, two novels that uh, hail a you. Um, um, there are a couple of famous examples of this. One would be Italo Calvino, um, who was uh, an Italian writer. I say it, you know, he's brought Latin America as a whole. It's actually, he's got his own transnational history, but he wrote this novel called If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler. Um, and it starts, you're about to begin reading If on a Winter's Night a Traveler by Italo Calvino. If you haven't put this book down, etc. I can cite that little page. But you know, it starts that way. And so what happens is you're interpolated, which means you become the you. No matter who you are, anyone you're reading that line, you're the you because it's telling you what you're doing and you're doing that. Um, and so I was always obsessed with that kind of form and I found it really intriguing. Then I read Alphus there, bumped me out, and I was like, oh, interpolation, it's this whole thing. Uh, like, I felt like it wasn't consensual, it was, a whole, it was a whole problem. So, what I've been thinking about um, now with these two novels, one by um, an Italo Togolese person, now um, Komla Ebri, is her surname, K O M L A, E B E E B R I, um, and uh, a writer that often gets known called Colonial, because she's a, a Eritrean by birth, but her grandparents, her grandfather was a soldier in colonial Eritrea. Um, Erminia del Oro, surname D E L L, apostrophe O R O. I have a little bibliography that I'm happy to put up on the website or something. Um, so these two writers, so one black, totally is born, um, naturalized in Italy, one ethnic white, literally ethnic white and Jewish Italian. Um, who identifies, with, you know, born and raised in Eritrea. She's an older woman now. Um, but they both hail a specific you in a relationship to the continent of Africa. So if I'm thinking about this relationship of um, that same, like, interpolation, um, I was thinking about it in relationship to these two texts and, like, the, the, the racial implication, the, the gendering of Africa. Both use Africa, like, cite Africa as a woman. There's one is specifically a female, like, her name is Nela, and she's really a stand in for the continent in this, in this character's return in Komala Every's text. Um, for Deloro, it's more maternal figure. So I was thinking about that and the complicity of, um, uh, or the coercion of that kind of you. On the other, that's the more negative or like the more cynical um, aspect of it. But also, uh, I'm trying to think about how to enact enact that politics of like embody and enact that politics of solidarity that I I see in snippets and and grasps. But in my work, more on the academic side of things, right? It's it's not a joke. I really do want that to be cut out, though maybe. Um, that people have said to me that they are the blacks of Italy, and I'm I'm just here. <laughs> I'm just here an actual, an actual, like, I just think um, there are people uh, often ready when they're doing this kind of work. It's not, it's not, I don't know, maybe it does happen in the US, but it's like, a, actually, I have her name is Rachel Bilzah, but like, but, but a very <laughs> common, but it's much more common and much more casual. People aren't saying that they're black, but there's a much more facility with which um, people uh, blur the lines of allyship, if that's a thing, I don't necessarily think it is, and, and solidarity with the actual subject position with whom they're supposed to be um, in allegiance or accomplices with. Um, and so I was thinking um, about that in terms of um, the you. Third thing, so sorry, those are two yous. The third and final you is, like I, I think I, I hope I said, um, at the start of one of them, I have had interactions with some specific people um, who have gone through the process of political asylum or, or migration. Um, and so some use, like when I named one um, in one poem, Barney, that's a real person um, whose name is different, but Barney is a very common Somali name, so I used a different one. Um, and uh, yeah, after some of these conversations and um, you know, living in Bologna, which is a, a, has a lot of East, it's a strong East African community, specifically um, Somali and um, Ethiopian Eritrean, 
uh, you know, Somalia also uh, um, knows, knows itself as a land of poets, and so sometimes people want to tell you a story or tell you about their journey, and it straight up is just like, speak, just poetry around, uh, around a meal, right? Everyone has, everyone's hand is in the injera, and then it just really, there's, there's a poetics there. So what wound up happening also is that I was involved in a lot of sort of ad hoc translation, and then people would kind of be drawn to that table, and then we're all speaking and we're talking, and then it would go, you do this, or you know what it's like for me, and this kind of you was hailed in a form of proximity that I'm just trying to, to recall. Those are the three. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about matter as well, and there's a few different parts of your incredible talk. Oh my goodness, this is so genuinely enjoyable. Um, that I'm trying to put together. And the way you kept coming back to enumeration was really interesting to me. And I'm wondering if you think about tactility with sort of materiality, not necessarily the one-to-one -one opposition, but as some kind of tension to the enumeration. I'm thinking of the poem that you started us off with when you talked about whiteness as touching everything. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the tactility of the first clip where we see this person really just holding on to yeah. these um, catalysts for memories. And I'm thinking of the way that the soundscapes that you provide us are really tediously worked through and that there is, although it's quite ephemeral, some kind of tactility to that sound yeah, as well. Straight up on that timetable. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about it until you said that, so thank you. I'm, I've written it down. I will cite you if it becomes a thing. Um, but no, side note, but definitely related. Um, I just started rock climbing, and uh, it's my second time just leaning into that California life now that I live here. But, um, <laughs> and. Uh, I changed my outfit, but this is, you know, for me it was really important because I'm very much in my head, so I found that comment to be really helpful because even, so rock climbing, my second time, I mean I nailed it, I got to the top, but I was using like the top part of my body and then I, my legs were like, and so the guy was like, use your legs to push up, you're climbing a wall, so it's like climbing and instead I'm there, like I can do a flip up, that's not what's going on here. So all of these things are sort of forcing me to basically remember that I have other senses. Mm -hmm. Like there is, I think maybe that's also part of your question that I wasn't really grasping, like there is, there are other senses happening here. And I think, what was so, I mean, a little bit frightening about trying to do this, like put together this presentation or like do this thing that I haven't necessarily done in this format before, um, uh, the novelty, which is exhilarating, but also uh, the different senses that I had to sort of think about all together, and I'm not used to sort of navigating in that way. So tactility for me, that's, I mean, this is a really powerful, um, yeah, I mean, I was, yeah, I named it what I was actually doing uh, once I could remember the word turntable, and like, that, that definitely is, because you're also with one hand recording it and making sure to stop it and make sure it's spliced in a certain way, but actively slowing down um, to get what you heard um, in the last clip. I think that's, um, if I think a bit more through that, I can be able to maybe address the actual materiality question in the space that was posed earlier. Yeah, thank you. Try rock climbing, it's great. Talk. It's great. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out, and I'm, I'm sure you've thought about this. Have you encountered any any moments or moments of connection between, let us say, the, the migrants coming through in Abelusa and the activists in the precarious movement, the white ethnic Italian labor activity? Um, have you been finding any places? I mean, I'm kind of scandalized by this topic again and again because it sees, to me, it's saying the, the white ethnic Italians have no memory of their own migration experience. Mm -hmm. And there's no. They didn't go anywhere. The, huh? They didn't go anywhere. They didn't go anywhere? Like the white, the ones who are here and the problem to. years ago, six million people left their country. Yes. They were starving to death. And I don't, I don't, right? Am I wrong? No, I said, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. 
But I'm saying the people you are referring to in terms of the white precariat, they can easily disidentify because they didn't go anywhere. Right? Oh, that's not different. That's not their family. They didn't go anywhere, and it was before Italy was Italy. So who even are those people? Right? But there is you a precarious moment. Oh, okay, there are two things: the precarious moment, the precarious in the labor movement. Mm -hmm. I, I seem to me that they would have a point to connect with African labor in Italy. But I, but you're saying there's not there's no point to connect. No, I think, I mean, I think he named 100% of a point of connection. Um, we also, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I need to tell anybody here that like obvious points of solidarity in, in these political times um, still don't happen because there's something else underlying and that thing is white supremacy. So uh, I'm gonna get up and, and chant it for the cameras. Um, so, right, so I mean, there are workers in, um, let's just go to the stage of Appalachia, I apologize, but right, who should easily be like in solidarity with Central American laborers or, or you know, or the black people that, are, that were there prior uh, under, um, after, after slavery, Jim Crow, et cetera, and that doesn't happen. It's, it's racism, um, one. But two, there is an aspect, uh, it's also a lot of what I was talking about were collaborations with, uh, white Italian people, right? So what I was saying about proximity and relationship to the state, it's helpful to hear this because I, I need to be more explicit um, in the future, is um, what I meant by that specifically is that it's run ostensibly by white Italian people, if you look at the board of directors, but if you're there and you see how it's practiced, the physical space, it's constantly ceded to. But you're not with the Italian bureaucracy or any bureaucracy, bureaucracy but Italy, um, with its constant flux at the moment, um, are going to give that space to a migrant to facilitate because then they're readily going to have to confront the state at any given moment. So it's about seeding the space, right? It's not an equal, I have half of it, you have half of it. You understand where your half has to go in order to enact actual solidarity. And then you seed the ground and you share the space in, in other um, sort of consensual ways. So that happens all the time. In Vernomuto, is constantly in interacting in, between them and their racial configura ethnic configurations and uh, uh, the DJs, the, the other people that they um, perform, organize, and collaborate with all the time. It's across um, the categories of citizen, migrant, and refugee. That's specifically um, what I was trying to address here. Um, and the last minor, not minor, the last point too is that there is an anarchist movement in Italy that is pretty strong in places like Bologna, which is known as the Red City, but you know, throughout Italy. And those people are often the people that um, are doing very explicit on the ground work, but they don't get quote unquote credit in a relationship to the, 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 the precarious movement that you're, you're referencing. Um, and I hate, I don't really like comparison often, but for to make it more palpable, that happens in the US as well, right? Like Antifa kind of dynamic, right? So those are the people, these anarchists are the people that are, who are on the ground, who are going to detention centers, who are breaking, not breaking in, but they're breaking things into the detention centers like water or food or mobile phones. So they're, you know, acting against the state, but specifically with the people <coughs> who are detained there because they wish to see an abolitionist world. Um, and they definitely are also, in places like Bologna, in Rome, in Naples, um, are also the people who are squatting and occupying spaces, and they're, they're sharing those spaces with migrants and refugees, right? It's not um, chic leftism where they like squat in places, which is happening in some places in London um, increasingly. No shade to London, but all the shade to that kind of that kind of politics, where people are squatting because they're still like um, nebulous squatters, the squatters' rights for now, um, even under this Tory government um, in in the UK. Uh, but they're not sharing that, so that those spaces are prim primarily white. In Bologna, um, in a couple of the housing coalitions that I know about, that doesn't happen. In fact, um, Meets Movimento Identità Francesuale, the Trans Identity Movement, is the name of this. Um, non-profit, but it doesn't mean the same thing in Italy, um, space, constantly ceding ground to these anarchists, many of whom are queer and trans um, and people of color. So these, these movements are happening, but it's often um, uh, on an ad hoc basis because there's no coalition that can be affected when you bring in things like labor. I mean, there is, but um, white supremacy will just show right back up and people will disband. Whiteness is a hell of a drug. You can keep that on camera. <laughs>
I, I wanted to ask um, a question about temporality. Yes. Because the, you know, your call for a, um, what you call it, um, coalitional imaginative practices, right? And you talk about emancipation and autonomy, but you very, I think, consciously chose not to bring in the term future, mm -hmm. or futurity, or futurism, mm -hmm. or any of those variants. Yes. So I wanted to hear what your, you know, your thoughts on that choice, that I think very conscious choice of not inscribing your project, yeah. not only what these uh, coalitional practices are doing, but you as a scholar, um, of course, queer studies and black studies and that intersection, like the choice of not, you know, yeah. not yeah. using any of those categories and concepts. Yeah, that's a great question. I wasn't slick at all. Thank you. Um, oftentimes, when I get the question of so I'm currently based and right transitioning from UC Irvine to UCLA, and I get a lot of questions not in California, but because of my affiliation, institutional affiliation about, um, like future gets perceived as an optim optimistic conceit, and then mm -hmm. I'm in a space that is known as a site of Afro-pessimism, ostensibly, mm -hmm. even though I'm not in that department, that's not my ministry. <laughs> um, and so that's one of the reasons that I, that I think about that. Also, I think if we can have a more capacious understanding of, you, you, may, you mentioned you hail's temporality, if we could have a more capacious understanding a non-linear Western understanding of temporality, the idea of a future often goes into, like, it, of, it often involves some sense of, um, what's the English word, like, asp <laughs> asp like asp waiting. But that doesn't even go. Yeah, that's not helpful. But yes, that's asp waiting, of waiting um, for it to arrive, right? So the future is here now, and it's a, and a, more for me in like an emancipatory um, orientation, as opposed to waiting for a future to arrive, or trying to usher out a future. I mean, you hear people, sometimes I hear in organizing spaces here, um, in, in the Bay actually, but also um, in, in the US in general, of like, this won't happen in our lifetimes, and we have to do it for the kids. But also like, it's like, I mean, like, I want to make sure that I know that I did the best for the now. Mm -hmm. um, even as we aspire to like, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't personally have any um, aspirations towards any kind of, I have no will to futurity, right? Um, uh, for me, that's often, it gets collapsed into like a Judeo-Christian sort of form of the, like, there's an afterlife, I do good now, there's something good going to happen to me in the future. But that kind of deferral is also the word I was thinking of. And that mode of deferral um, often um, um, gives people an out that I don't think we deserve. I don't think that, and again, I, I say the word moral, but then I always want to take it back. Um, it's my own religion, like, hang up some, in proximity to a religious upbringing. Um, but there's, there's some kind of imperative that we need to consider, I think, in terms of thinking about what we do now and, and what we are meant to become. And we can become a thing now mm -hmm. without having to hail a future sense, even if that future is five minutes from now, because we're always becoming something in relationship to other people, I think, and things. Thank you. Sense. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, I'm being signaled that I should oh. wrap up um, okay. the question and answer. But I think there are various Water and wine. Water and wine. Water and wine. Water and wine. <laughs> <laughs> I can <laughs> say if people have or like or shy, I feel really vulnerable. So thank you so much um, no, thank you. for being here. I have a website if that's not vain to like say. So you can like contact me on that if you want to just shoot me a thing. I'm gonna pull it up, but no one gave the left a picture. I'm aware of what it's gonna look like, but if I just say my name, it's not going to uh, help you because it's written like my Twitter. So it's that. Look at that. The same picture as the, the thing. Yeah. So that's the website. And then you can hit that contact situation there. I said no giggling at the picture. You're giggling in the back. No. <laughs> you can contact me there and I'll go to my email or that same URL at Twitter or at goes before the Twitter. But I only tweet about murder, she wrote, and white supremacy. So if you're not interested, <laughs> don't bother. Thank you. Thank you.